In June 1862, Major General Johnny Wool, now in command of the Middle Department, came with at least one staff officer to Harpers Ferry by train. Colonel Dixon S. Miles met him at the station, and the two officers spent the day going from point to point through the lower town, up to Camp Hill and over to Bolivar Heights. Whether General Wool went on to Elk Ridge, the record does not say. Wool and Miles were acquainted with each other since the Mexican War, in which both men were present together in Taylor's army and participated in the Battle of Buena Vista. So, it is fair to say that at least at that time, in June 1862, the two men were two old regular soldiers with much in common. At that time, there was but one regiment present at the ferry, the 22nd New York State Militia, under the command of Colonel James Monroe, previously a captain in the regular infantry and author of a book on infantry drill. Monroe died at the ferry from disease in July 1862 and was replaced by Lloyd Absenwall, a New York lawyer, his father operated the Aston Wall Steamship Company and was an influential member of Lincoln's entourage. The 22nd was a 90-day volunteer regiment full of recently enlisted farmers and townspeople with no military training. The record shows that this regiment spent their time at the ferry drilling on the parade ground, which was located between the Charleston Pike and the Shenandoah River, just north of Bolivar Heights. When the regiment was not engaged in drill, under the eye of Colonel Miles, the men practiced loading and unloading their rifles, and eventually learning how to effectively use them. However, no sooner had the regiment become proficient at these soldiers' skills that their term of enlistment had expired. And on September 1, 1862, they boarded cars and returned to New York, where they mustered out on September 4. A few days after the arrival of the 22nd New York State Militia, the 12th, New York State Militia arrived at the ferry under the command of Colonel William G. Ward, a 28-year-old graduate of Columbia Law School. Like the 20th, the 12th spent the summer drilling on the parade ground, practicing the manual of arms and picketing the railroads. By September 1, its three-month enlistment was expired and the men in the ranks demanded to be released, to go home. At first, General Walt refused to allow this, but a day later, permitted it. But, by this time, the Confederate Army had crossed the Potomac, and the 12th's way of departure was closed. During the investment of the ferry, Colonel Miles placed the 12th at Camp Hill, the men refusing to shoulder arms. On July 10, 1862, a third three-month regiment, the 87th Ohio, arrived at the ferry under the command of Henry Banning. Banning, a lawyer by occupation and enlisted in the Union Army as a private in April 1861, Commissioned as a captain in the 4th Ohio in June 1861, he had participated in McClellan's movement into West Virginia and was present at the engagement at Rich Mountain and later in the spring of 1862 at the Battle of Winchester and at Cross Keys. In late June 1862, the 4th Ohio had become attached to McClellan's army at Harrison's Landing and Banning on June 25, 
obtained his commission as colonel of the newly formed 87th Ohio. Between his arrival at the ferry on July 10 to September, Miles had the 87th Ohio posted at Point of Rocks, picketing the railroad as far east as Nolan's Ferry. When the Confederate Army began crossing the Potomac on September 3, just as the 87th term of enlistment had expired, Miles ordered the regiment, along with a section of guns manned by gunners of the 5th New York Heavy Artillery, to take post at Sandy Hook. And when Confederate brigades came down Pleasant Valley on September 11, the 87th was posted on Camp Hill, leaving the 1st Maryland Potomac Home Guard under a preacher named Malsby to support the two guns in the lower town, covering the approaches to the pontoon and railroad bridges. Though, unlike the men of the 125th New York, the men of the 87th Ohio had agreed to serve the colors pending the outcome of the Confederate offensive. These three regiments were the only regiments camped at Harper's Ferry and within Colonel Miles' control through June, July, and August until, in recognition of their enlistments ending, General Wool had pulled three New York regiments out of the stream of regiments passing through Baltimore to Washington and had ordered them, one after the other, to move to Harper's Ferry. These two were three-month regiments. The first of these to arrive was the 115th New York Volunteer Regiment under the command of Colonel Simeon Salmon, a farmer and politician. The regiment reached the ferry on September 1, Upon its arrival, the men were given rifles and posted as pickets along the length of the Winchester and Potomac Railroad. On September 11, the regiment was drawn back to the ferry, and on the 12th, Colonel Miles posted two of his ten companies on Elk Ridge, first covering the Sharpsburg Road near where it passes the Kennedy Farm, and then on the 13th, as the Union position at the lookout was crumbling, these companies were sent as reinforcement and received their baptism of fire as they met the South Carolinians of Kershaw's brigade in combat. Holding their own, with the help of other units, Miles sent in support for two hours until the Mississippians of Barksdale's brigade began to seep into the right rear. And this, together with the pressure of the South Carolinians being exerted on their left flank, caused the few officers still active to lose control of the men in the line, and a disorganized retreat swept the Union and down the western slope of the mountain to the heavy artillery battery, where an effort to abort the route was made but failed, and the Union men left the mountain, spiking the three heavy guns in the four Napoleons. The 111th New York, under the command of a cabinet maker, Colonel Jesse Seagoing, also arrived on September 1 by train from Baltimore. On September 13, brought back to the ferry from picket duty, Colonel Miles sent several of the regiment's companies to Elk Ridge, where they arrived about noon and joined the Union skirmish line on the summit. And participated in the firefight until the 126th New York lost control of itself and a scramble down the mountain ensued. The 125th New York arrived at the ferry on September 3 under the command of Colonel George L. Willard, a regular Army infantry captain who organized the regiment in August. Colonel Miles posted it at Martinsburg in conjunction with the 65th Illinois Regiment under the command of Colonel Daniel Cameron, which had been holding the place since July 1862. The 125th arrived at the ferry from Martinsburg on September 12 and took post on Camp Hill. On the 14th, 
when the Confederate batteries opened on Camp Hill from the crown of Loud Knights, the men of the regiment fled the hill in a panic, most of them crowding into a ravine in the swale between the hill and Bolivar Heights, where they remained into the afternoon. Sometime soon after, Colonel Miles ordered Willard to gather his men and march them across the pike and take position in the woodland between it and the river, sending skirmishers forward to feel the enemy. The regiment remained in this position until nightfall, when the men were pulled back behind the battery of guns limbered along the edge of the pike. The last of the regiments General Wool sent to the ferry was the 126th New York, under the command of Colonel Elikim Sherrill, a politician who had organized the regiment in August and had arrived with it in early September. On the 12th, Colonel Miles ordered it to Elk Ridge, where it established its main line across the summit, about a mile north of the lookout, with a skirmish line going forward and engaging the South Carolina regiments of Kershaw's brigade, which were advancing southward from Solomon's Gap. Through the day of the 12th, the men of the 126 held their own against Kershaw's men. The individuals of both sides, using the trees as shields, firing their rifles, reloading, moving a few paces to another tree, the woods filling with smoke, the winding and whirling of the bullets smacking into the trunks of the trees, the cries of wounded, and slowly, grudgingly, the New Yorkers stepped backward, feeling the weight of the Confederate firepower, feeling the pressure on their flanks, until, as night was falling, the skirmishers were now folding themselves into the Union main line, and the whole of the force lay down on their arms and leaves and waited out the night. When morning came, the woods exploded again with rifle fire, the Confederates coming on now in what seemed greater force, and the Union men hunkered behind a barricade of logs that extended across the width of the summit, blazing away, until, after two hours of this, Colonel Shirell leaped upon the barricade, hollering exhortations to his men. A bullet blew his jaw away, and a great groan issued from the men as they saw him topple to the ground. Soldiers rushed to him, and four of them, taking him by the limbs, began to carry him to the rear, and at the sight of this, several of the companies, their captains gone, the lieutenants nowhere to be seen, began to leave the firing line, moving to the rear, and this produced a panic in the regiment as a whole, and the barricade was abandoned, the men now backpedaling away and then turning to run. Distinct from these regiments under Colonel Miles' command were the four regiments under General White's command, which, until General Halleck's order to White of September 2 to abandon the forts, artillery, and supplies at Winchester and retreat to the ferry, were part of Pope's Army of Virginia and posted at Winchester. Of these, like the regiments General Wool had assigned to the ferry, including the 65th Illinois posted at Martinsburg, the 9th Vermont was a raw regiment that had arrived at Winchester on July 24, 1862, with no combat experience. The other three regiments, the 39th New York, 32nd Ohio, and 60th Ohio, had some experience, more or less, some exposure to combat in the course of Fremont's pursuit of Jackson in the spring, which had ended with Jackson's repulse of Fremont at Cross Keys and Port Republic. By General Wool's order, and to General White's chagrin, these regiments came under Colonel Miles' command when they arrived at the ferry on September 4th. 
Considering the reality then, as opposed to the story, the clicks of historians tell the kids, it's plain to see that unless Colonel Miles had in hand some 500 Africans to do the labor during the summer, General Wool had no objective basis to reasonably believe fortifications of the magnitude he claimed at the special commission hearing he thought had been constructed, had in fact been constructed at the ferry. Equally as plain to see, given the reality, is that seven of the ten regiments General Wool had brought together under Colonel Miles' command were untrained, undrilled kids taken straight off the farms and from the villages of the rural counties of New York State, dressed in uniforms and handed rifles and sent to Harper's Fairly hardly two weeks before their engagement with the eight regiments of hardcore veterans of the war from Bull Run in July 1861 to the Seven Days in June 1862, which formed Kershaw's and Barksdale's brigades. Then at the crisis, a broken ran is hardly a surprise. Laughable to blame Colonel Miles for failing to hold them to the fire. 